Welcome back from lunch, everybody. Um, so later today, we're going to hear about conversational UX, which is really a fascinating topic. But right now, we're going to focus on good old graphical user interfaces. And I also have the task of keeping you from all falling into a food coma. I've got the coveted after lunch spot. So my goal today is mainly to show you a bunch of colorful pictures, some videos and animations, and leave you hopefully awake with five tips to help make uh, interfaces that are immediately understandable and quick to use. So first, let's start with the building blocks of any user interface. I'm going to start with a couple dry definitions, but I think this is worth reinforcing. So talking about affordances and signifiers, uh, a lot of you probably read The Design of Everyday Things by Don Norman. Uh, and you might be familiar with these ideas. But I think as designers, we tend to misuse the terms. So I w just wanted to refresh our memory a little bit. So designers usually talk about affordances as being these sort of visual properties of an object that help us to understand how to use it. But Don Norman's definition is actually more abstract than that. An affordance is a relationship between the properties of an object and the capabilities of an agent that determine how the object might be used. So a doorknob, for example, affords turning, but not for a dog, or not for a one-year-old, or a person that doesn't have full use of their hands. Um, and, but the important thing is that, as designers, our job is to help people to perceive these affordances, or to understand what they can do with an object or an interface. Uh, and when you hear a designer going on and on about affordances, nine, nine times out of 10, what they're actually talking about is signifiers. So signifiers are the visual cues and marks that help us to understand what an object can do. They help us to perceive affordances, they communicate the appropriate behavior, and they show us where and how to interact with objects. So I've been thinking a lot about affordances and signifiers recently because I have a daughter who's just about to turn two. And I've been watching her gain all these amazing capabilities and begin exploring all the objects in our house. And we just inherited this huge box of Duplos from a family with older kids. Uh, and she's able to look at the top of one block and the bottom of another block and figure out how to put them together to build things. And it's really pretty amazing to watch a child be able to do that. Um, and the sort of, uh, you know, the shape of a Duplo block in itself signifies how you can use it. It has these studs on the top and tubes on the bottom. Yes, those are the, uh, those are the official Duplo terms. I had to look it up. Um, that suggest how they fit together to build bigger objects. Um, this is one of our favorite games to play. This is called Mad Max Fury Road. And um, it's, it's a little bit more G-rated than the movie. I mean, this guy in the back here has brought some baguettes in case he gets hungry later. He can make a sandwich. Yes, there are Duplo baguettes. Uh, but my point is, when my daughter finds a new kind of Duplo object, uh, she can examine it looking for visual cues. And she experiments with the other blocks. And she's able to figure out what's possible with that kind of block and put them together to make these huge stacks of blocks without my help. And having, having a little kid around helps you to appreciate that humans are fundamentally tool users and, and tool makers. And as part of what defines us as a species, it actually comes as naturally to us as language. And kids learn basic tool use, like using a spoon to eat food at well under one year old. And at under 24 months, they actually have the ability to invent tools. So a child can learn to use a stick or another object to reach an out of, out of reach object with that. Um, it's really pretty amazing. It's definitely part of what defines us as humans. So when my daughter had barely learned to crawl, she discovered this little door in the bottom of our fridge. And as the de designers no doubt intended, she perceived that the hole was a signifier that meant, put your fingers in here. <laughs> and she did. And she opened this little door without ever having been shown how to do this. And unfortunately, what happens when you pull open that door is it pulls out the filter that filters our water. Air gets into the filter. It's permanently ruined. You have to go to Home Depot, and you spend $60 on a new water filter, or a new water filter for your fridge. <laughs> Um, so like any good designer, you know, I, I added a constraint. <laughs> yes, that's white duct tape. It's very classy. I'm a UX designer, UI designer, not an interior designer. Um, uh, but the point is, you know, a good point for this is that you should always test your designs. And even if you only have one user, especially if it's a toddler, you can find a lot of flaws in a, a badly designed product. Uh, my daughter also really loves exploring my office at home. And I, as Eric mentioned, um, I work in the audio technology industry, designing software for audio engineers and musicians. And so I have lots of boxes with knob switches and buttons on them in my office that she loves to play with. This is a synthesizer from the early 80s. Uh, this was actually originally sold at Radio Shack. Radio Shack used to sell synthesizers. Um, this is my guitar amplifier. I have to be really careful when I plug into my guitar amplifier because my daughter tends to walk into my office and just turn all the knobs up. Um, so it gets a little bit loud. Um, and here are some of my guitar pedals. And notice all the different textures, buttons, and switches on these devices. I love how tactile music technology is. It's full of these really strong signifiers, like these contoured knobs and bright orange switches. 
Um, some of them signal that they can be turned or flipped or have a texture that shows you can grasp them or rest your foot on them to, to control them that way. And there, of course, there are also these labels and marks around the controls that are more descriptive. They describe what the purpose of a controller is or what its position or current state is. Um, so far, we've just been talking about the physical world, but I assume most of you here make software or websites. And since the dawn of the graphical user interface, and this is from Xerox Park, so that is the dawn of the graphical user interface, uh, signifiers have also shown us how to interact with computers, phones, tablets, and other screen-based devices. And there are a couple of sort of different classes of signifiers that we use in screens, um, from my perspective. And um, from, from day one, GUIs have borrowed signifiers from the physical world, things like buttons, switches, and sliders. And these controls really borrow literally from their real world, world counterparts, right? Pushing a button or sliding a toggle works very much on a screen like it works in the real world, except you just have a mouse between you and the screen. Or if you're using a touch screen, you don't. Um, but these borrowed interactions had the benefit of allowing people to use previous knowledge of the world and apply that knowledge to the digital world. Uh, and then, you know, with computers, we also gained these sort of computer native signifiers, which are things like icons uh, with text under them. And we've learned that you can, you know, double click on an icon with text under it and it opens a folder or it opens an application. Uh, hyperlinks, which magically take you to another page when you click on that blue text or thumbnail-based interfaces, you know, that, uh, that open a larger ver version of an image or a video when you click on them. Um, and and these, these types of interactions can be very intuitive, intuitive too. And my daughter, for example, there's a, you know, uh, animal matching game on my iPad that she's a master at that uses a thumbnail-based interface. And she didn't really need a whole lot of instruction to figure that out. She just pressed, the, you know, pressed an image, it got bigger, and she knew how to use a thumbnail interface. Um, but anyway, my point is that these sort of borrowed signifiers and computer native signifiers lived in perfect harmony together for about three decades. And then we got to 2013 when iOS 7 came out. And a lot of you that have been designing for a while probably remember this. And that's when Apple uh, released iOS 7 and it marked a shift in UI design away from interfaces that relied on digital representations of these physical controls with photorealistic textures and such. And instead, it moved us toward these interfaces that are more flat and favor computer-native signifiers. Uh, Apple weren't the first to do this, but they certainly made this trend. Uh, they sort of moved this into a trend. Um, and a lot, around this time, you heard the word skeuomorphism a lot, right? So this was the idea that uh, you know, interfaces that mimic the function and visual aesthetic of physical objects and digital interfaces. And iOS 7 was really a reaction against this. And, and Apple really framed it as a crutch. You know, Johnny Ives basically said that people don't need buttons anymore. They're comfortable touching glass. We don't need these physical signifiers. And so you might remember that iOS started to look a lot different um, back then, more like it looks today. So like the unlock slider disappeared and we got sort of this barely legible shimmery text that you slide to, to unlock your phone. Uh, the messages app became a lot flatter and simpler. You know, the, the messages lost their sort of glare and shadow and bubbly nature. Uh, and all the buttons kind of disappeared, right? There, now there was just these text signifiers in, in place of buttons. Um, and this flatness really solidified a trend toward tasteful minimalism throughout Apple's products, both on the you know, mobile platforms and desktop and web that continues today. So you might be a little bit surprised if you were to open Apple Logic, which is Apple's professional music application, because it looks something like this. Um, this is a screenshot from Apple Logic 10, which was also released in 2013. And you might be thinking, wait, what? I thought Apple killed interfaces that look like physical things. Aren't those knobs? Is that a guitar amplifier covered with fake leather? Um, what happened? Um, I don't think this was, this was a mistake. I mean, Apple's had like six or seven years to catch up and, and, and you know, flatten out this interface, and they, they don't do it. And I think the team that works on Logic realizes that these interfaces communicate effectively to their particular niche of users. And I think it's important to recognize that immediacy is not just about usability, it's also about the emotional factors of a design, right? It, is it authentic? Is it inspiring? Can I trust it? And I mentioned before that I'm a guitarist. And one thing you have to understand about the electric guitar is that the guitar amplifier is as important to the sound uh, of an electric guitar as the guitar itself. And um, if I'm gonna plug my guitar into a computer to record something, I wanna be sure it sounds like a real amplifier. Um, so another uh, really popular music production tool is called Ableton Live. Um, it comes with this guitar amp simulator and it sounds really pretty good. It's got this minimal flat user interface with a very simple sort of iconic representation of the amps that it simulates. And I'll be honest, I shouldn't be influenced by looks. I've worked in this industry for a really long time. 
uh, I trust my ears, and I've heard a lot of amp simulators. And I know this one sounds basically pretty good, but I still have a strong feeling that I can't trust it. Um, I can't shake that feeling. It's kind of strange, but I feel like when I play through this amp, I don't sound as good as when I'm playing through a real amp. Um, and Apple's, you know, Apple Logic has a totally different approach. They have these very realistic, detailed interfaces that are based on the, the real life amplifiers that they're simulating. Uh, and good amp simulators, by the way, are really, really hard to make. It can take years of work to release one of these products. There are many, many electrical and physical factors that you have to model. There's a lot of complex math involved that the engineers I work with uh, work on. Um, and it requires, you know, a lot of work. And so a product like that, should have an interface that reflects that care and authenticity, I think. Um, I mean, which would feel more authentic to you if you're a guitarist looking for a particular kind of guitar sound? And don't get me wrong, there are plenty of situations where a flat or minimal interface is the right choice uh, for the job. This is actually another plugin inside of Apple's Logic. It's a, a, a parametric equalizer. And this is more of a utility tool, and it's basically a graph that you can interact with. It's very flat and very modern. So I'm not wholesale saying you should use skeuomorphism. Um, but I do think there are some places that, uh, types of products, it's appropriate. I think, you know, for example, in cars, um, car companies know this. That's why I think a lot of digital dashboards aren't just a bunch of numbers and graphs. There's still an immediacy, both functional and emotional, to these old-fashioned gauges. Video game designers definitely know this, right? Realism can be an important storytelling element, like the inventory system in the Fallout series of games. And yes, Apple knows this. That's why they put analog hands on digital watches, even though there have been a number of studies that show digital numbers are easier to read when you're telling the time. But we don't just wear watches to tell time, do we? There are emotional factors, nostalgia, how we want to be seen by others. There are a lot of factors in play when we buy a product and use a product. Um, and plus, as a designer, I'll admit, it's just fun to work on realistic interfaces. At Sound Toys, we did this uh, product a couple years ago called Little Plate, which is based on these enormous um, plate reverbs from the 50s. So the way the plate reverb sounds, uh, works is it has this enormous plate of, sh of steel that's suspended inside of this cage. And then you run sound through it, and it creates the sound that sounds like a big room. Um, and they were really popular in the 50, 50s, 60s, and 70s, and you hear it's a really recognizable sound that you hear on a lot of records from that time period. And so we actually collected a lot of these plate reverbs. This is actually a video shot in a garage around the corner from here we have, where we have about six of these plate reverbs. Um, each of them weighs about 500 pounds. Um, so the typical you know, engineer in their home studio is not gonna be able to afford one, much less move one into their house. Um, and we spent over a year studying these devices to kind of learn their secrets and then uh, developed a plugin that was based on them to use inside of programs like Apple Logic. Uh, designing the interface for that project was really fun. I mean, I love using Sketch and Figma as much as the next guy, but it's really fun to break out 3D software and think like an industrial designer. Um, so I got to kind of borrow these sort of visual cues from hardware from the 1950s um, with these sort of really big, uh, chunky knobs and LEDs. Um, and it helps to give a sense of the legacy of, of this device that we, were, that we were simulating. And it was a really fun project for that reason. I got to sort of remix visual cues from, uh, from devices from that era, like the info badges, the metal info badges that you would see on sort of test equipment from that era, and incorporate our branding into that. Uh, so it was a really fun project, and here's what it looks like inside of Apple Logic. So now you're probably thinking, well, but I make websites, because that's most of what UX design is in our world, right? And sometimes I do too. Um, and making a physical 3D interface is not going to be appropriate probably for most of the projects you get to work on. But there's good news. As interface designers, there are a lot of things we can do to strengthen the screen-based uh, signifiers other than just literally mimicking physical objects. Um, so how can we make sure at a glance that uh, people understand what's possible with our interfaces? I mean, everybody's talking about Nielsen-Norman Group studies today, so I, I have to bring one up, right? Um, Nielsen-Norman Group did this eye-tracking study in 2017 where they compared pages with more traditional sort of button and tab signifiers and links to nearly identical pages that used a more flat, minimalist style. And the results were really, really interesting. Um, you know, the, the, uh, the sort of more traditional pages used buttons, for example, that had more depth cues like glare and shadows. They might be a little bit skeuomorphic, you might say. Uh, and the flat pages had weaker signifiers like flat buttons and so-called ghost buttons that are just text with a sort of light border around them to suggest the shape of a button. And then they gave users some basic tasks, and what they found is that users spent about 22% more time on the flat pages doing the same tasks. 
Um, people had to study the elements on the pages more to carefully understand what to do with them. Is this a label? Is this a link? Is this a button? What can I do with this thing? Can I click it? And it kind of makes intuitive sense, right? Having controls that have physical details like glare and shadows provide these visual cues that can help you to identify what's a foreground element from what's a background element. Um, but even if you're aiming for a very flat, modern style in your interfaces, there are definitely things you can do to make sure your users know what to click. So when you're designing buttons, for example, sure, you can go all out skeuomorphic. This is an interface uh, from Waves at the top here, uh, modeling a piece of equip equipment from Abbey Road Studios, and it's got this really um, cool camera-like perspective where the buttons appear to just jump off the screen. That's pretty extreme. Most, most of you probably aren't going to do anything like that. Um, but, you know, if you look at something like Google's material design, design language, they use very flat elements, but they use these sort of subtle visual cues like shadows to show that the button can be pushed down. Um, so you can sort of marry that flat world with a more physical world. Um, and you can also have really super flat interfaces like this one from InVision's website that just uses a lot of contrast to show that the button is clickable and that it's separate from the background. You can also have some signifiers that are we intentionally weaker than others, right? So um, on this dialog box here at the bottom from, uh, I think that's from LastPass, um, the save button is very high contrast from the background and draws a lot of attention while the cancel button is lower contrast. It sort of blends in a little bit more, but that's the secondary action. So it actually helps that it's a little bit, there's a little bit less clear figure ground relationship there. Um, if you're talking about something like, uh, oh, I'm sorry, one more example with this. White space is also a very effective way to communicate figure and ground relationships. So putting a lot of space around a button or using a faded out image like this uh, to make it clear that that's a background element are also pretty effective ways of showing what's clickable. Now, if we're talking about a uh, computer native signifier like links, uh, contrast and consistency are really the key there. And the most traditional and recognizable way to use a link is to have blue underlined text, right? But uh, using a contrasting color without an underline is still very effective. That's actually one of the results of that Nielsen Norman uh, uh, eye tracking study, is that they found this sort of contrasting color links work basically just as well as old fashioned blue text underlined links, which is good because a lot of the websites I see out there are using that um, sort of pattern nowadays. Um, what you want to avoid with links is using the same color for links as body copy, even if they're not in line with that copy. Um, it's just not enough of an information sent there for people to follow. Um, same thing with, you know, using the color blue. We're so primed to expect that blue is a link color that when you use blue for things like headers and, and, uh, and captions and things like that, you have to be careful if it's not something that's actually clickable. So for icons, you always want to pair icons with labels for maximum benefit. Um, Drake doesn't know what those beautiful icons you design mean, right? There are very few ideas. I know this is a really old meme, but I'm a dad. You know, old memes are the new dad jokes. Just bear with me. Um, <laughs> So there are very few ideas that can be perfectly summarized by a little icon. And if you have one, congratulations. But if not, consider labeling your icon. So you get two benefits from that. First of all, as users sort of learn your interface and start to recognize what those icons mean, they'll work faster. But including a label reduces ambigu uh, ambiguity and people can understand, you know, with a little bit of reading what that control does. And if you don't believe me, just remember uh, this, this image has been floating around on the internet forever. I don't, I, I don't know who to, attribute, who to attribute this to, but. Does anybody know what these laundry icons mean? I, what does triangle mean? Does anybody here know what triangle means? No, I didn't think so. All right. Um, so sort of side note here, what about invisible interactions? A lot of the interfaces we use today, like uh, you know, iPhones or Android devices, have a lot of you know, sort of gesture-based um, interactions. And I think the short answer is yes, I think it's okay to have invisible interactions like that. Um, that could definitely be an entire talk on its own, but I want to at least mention that, that this can be useful. And I think the key is that, you know, once you've discovered, uh, if this is sort of a discoverable interaction um, that's easy to remember and it's used throughout a platform and you're likely to remember it, I think that's, that can be a perfectly okay thing. But uh, the important thing to remember here is that recognition is easier than recall. Um, so before you, you know, use a three finger double tap for your new feature, just remember that we're better at recognizing things we previously experienced than just remembering them blindly. Uh, so never make something into an invisible gesture just because it seems novel or fun. Do it with purpose. Um, so interfaces, we've pretty much been talking about sort of individual signifiers up to this point, but at some point you're going to have to put signifiers together to make a full interface. Um, and, and thinking about the sort of topic of immediacy, I started thinking, you know, what is the most immediate interface you can think of? 
Um, is it something like Uber, where you just enter a destination, you choose a size, hit confirm, put the phone back in your pocket, and you're done? It's pretty amazing, right? Uh, very immediate experience. Or something like Tinder, um, where you swipe left, swipe right, make split-second judgments about other human beings. What could be more immediate than that? Uh, <laughs> Honestly, I don't understand you kids with your Twitter, um, you know, or with your Tinder. I, I met my wife the old-fashioned way on OkCupid. And uh, <laughs> do you have any idea how many questions I answered? I mean, it was, it was insane. <laughs> Hundreds, thousands. Um, but actually, the most immediate interface I could think of was this Neve VR large format console. Um, OK, I'm seeing a couple of grimaces there. This is really, you know, not that hard to understand. I'm going to walk you through it. Um, so large format consoles like this are used by audio engineers to record and mix records. Um, so they basically, they're used to combine the sounds of many instruments together to create a song that you might hear on the radio or on Spotify. And while a lot of the functions of consoles like this are available in computers now in software like Pro Tools, um, many engineers still prefer to mix records on consoles. And I think a lot of the reason for that is the immediacy of this interface. Um, but you might be thinking, you know, how can something so dense and complex provide anything that can be called immediacy? So I'm going to let you watch a couple minutes of Tom Elmhurst mixing an Adele record. Um, and this is from a video from a, a great site called Mix with the Masters. Uh, they provide these great master classes with engineers like Tom. And to give you a little bit of context, this is early on in the process of mixing a song. Tom's trying to get the overall balance of all the instruments into the right basic shape so that the vocals sit properly on top of them. Uh, so let me just get my volume control here. So I'm going to just let you watch about two minutes of this. Did he look confused at all of you? <laughs> Do you think he had any trouble finding his, his way around this sea of knobs and switches and buttons? No. I, I would say, actually, this is a great example of the psychological concept of flow. So this is somebody who's using an interface that's really matched to his own experience level. It's a really complex tool, but this guy's also got a really complex mental model of how to mix a record. Um, and so he's sort of perfectly matched to this tool. And he has access to every instrument. As he hears things he wants to change, he can just freely move immediately, shift focus from one instrument to another, and make the adjustments he needs. Um, it's a really brilliantly designed interface. And, um, and remember what I was saying earlier about recognition being easier than recall. This is an interface where just, just about everything is about recognition, right? Very little is hidden in this interface. Now, the downside of that is that users still need to search an interface like this to find what they need. And that brings me to uh, the Gestalt principles. So some of you have studied the Gestalt principles. If you went to design school, you probably or hopped around design blogs. I'm sure you've heard of the Gestalt principles. So basically, the idea behind this is over 100 years ago, the Gestalt psychologists sought to understand how our brains form a whole picture from the individual pieces we see. And uh, the principles they observed are still used by designers today um, to help establish relationships between different elements in the interface. And uh, if you look up the Gestalt principles online, you'll see like you know usually diagrams with these little sort of dots and boxes and things like that. But it's a little bit easier, I think, to understand in practice if we look at a real interface. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this console with some of those principles in mind. Um, so for example, Tom's console has been set up in such a way that uh, the controls for different kinds of recordings are organized into groups. And there's actually a physical distance between these groups. So this is a good example 
of the proximity principle. And when you put elements of a design close to one another, they will appear to form groups. By putting space between elements in an interface, you can show that they're different from one another. Um, now, when you look, sort of zoom into a part of this console, and yes, this is an entire Mute and Eve console that I made in Sketch. I have a lot of free time. Um, <laughs> this is the kind of thing I enjoy. Don't judge me. Um, when you look more closely at these sections, you'll start to see that while this console is packed full of controls, the controls themselves form these repeating vertical patterns, right? And this is the Gestalt continuity principle. So when elements of a design are arranged in, in a continuous line or curve, you tend to see them as related. And, and what each of these vertical strips does on a console is it controls an individual sound recording, right? So this interface is starting to get, uh, starting to seem probably a little bit simpler because most of its surface area is just one pattern repeated 72 times. Easy to understand, right? Um, but each of those strips, individual strips, is still packed full of controls. And if you look at it a little bit closer, you'll notice that there are these sort of white lines that separate the columns into even smaller groups. And this is a good um, representation of the Gestalt common region principle. So I know this is a shocker, but if you put a box around a group of things, that people will see those things as related, right? Seems like common sense, but it's also a principle that's been tested. If you zoom in even farther to one of these groups, you'll see even more ways of grouping things. And this section of the strip is an equalizer. And most of you have probably used an equalizer if you've adjusted the bass and treble in your car. Um, this is just a more complex version of the same thing. It gives you more detailed, precise control over different frequencies. Um, and here there's not enough room to really use separation or common region to show what controls are related, so the designers chose color. Um, and the similarity principle, Gestalt similarity principle, basically states that we see elements of a design that physically resemble each other as part of the same group. Um, so you can use color in this way to group different, different objects. Now if you move back to a bird's eye view of the console, you'll see that those colors also form these horizontal lines. So we're back to that continuity principle, right? So if you're EQing one channel, your eye can quickly move across that console to another channel and adjust the same band of that EQ. Um, so I know it's a really complex interface and most of the interfaces you work on will probably not get to this level of complexity, but those Gestalt principles are really useful for all kinds of interfaces and it's a great exercise to go through uh, those principles and sort of look at your interface through that lens and sort of evaluate what you see. Uh, so with the Gestalt principles we touched on color, but I think color is worth talking about in a little bit more detail. Um, color can help us visually group objects like we just saw. It can also be a code that transmits information without showing text. And it can draw our user, uh, user's attention to important features. It can also, you know, communicate product or brand identity. Um, and I think the, that last point is actually kind of sometimes frustrating for UI designers because, you know, we don't always get full freedom to use color in our interfaces. You know, if, if, you, if Starbucks is gonna hire me to design their mobile app, I can guarantee you it's probably gonna be green, right? Um, but we, when we do have freedom to use color, we can do some really interesting things. So uh, color coding can be incredibly useful, but it definitely has limitations. And let's say you're, you were visiting me back when I lived in Boston. And if you were arriving at South Station, I might tell you to take the red line to Porter. So how long would you need to study this map to find your way there? Probably not very long. I mean, the, the Boston T is designed on, around only a few colors. The lines are named after those colors, which, which makes it easier to understand. And if you look at the ends of each of these lines, they're also labeled with initials like RL for red line or GL for green line. So it's even friendly to colorblind users. There's, a, there's sort of a redundant cue there that you can use to identify those lines. Now if you go to London, right, and I ask you to take the northern line from Camden to London Bridge, you're gonna have to study this map a little bit, right? Uh, you're gonna need to refer to a legend to remember that the, the, the northern line is black. You're gonna need to look carefully at the map because the Piccadilly line is navy blue, which doesn't look at all like black in a dark tube station. Actually, it's pretty hard to tell apart. Um, and the London tube map started its life a lot more like the Boston map, but as the city grew and the lines grew, it lost its immediacy, right? Now you have to really study that map to understand what color means. Not to say that's a good or bad thing, just it's less immediate. Now if you want a really immediate experience, you should definitely go to Helsinki. Because there's only one line and it's bright orange. Everything is bright orange. If you want to know what train to get on, get on the bright orange train. Um, if you want to know what seat to sit in, sit in the bright orange seat. And the first time I rode the Helsinki Metro, I was like, why is everything so orange? It's just so bright. And then I stepped outside and realized, ah, okay. <laughs> um, the color does have meaning, but in the case of the Helsinki Metro, it's more like a, a brand color. Um, 
the orange signs are really highly visible, you know, the stations are easy to find, and they stand out in this really low contrast winter environment. So even tourists learn quickly that, you know, without needing to read anything, that orange means metro. And uh, here's another music production uh, screenshot. This is a, another mix engineer, Andrew Sheps, um, showing how he sets up a Pro Tools session. And color coding can be really useful. Uh, you know, one way to sort of make color coding more useful is to let users choose their own colors. And in a complex interface like Pro Tools, which is a mixing tool that's sort of like the digital version of that large format console, um, you know, whenever this engineer gets a, a session, he immediately color codes all the different instruments. Because these projects can be, they can have hundreds of different recordings in them. So he's got his own system, you know, where drums are blue, vocals are yellow, background vocals are a slightly different tint of yellow than, than uh, lead vocals, et cetera. And I'm not going to show you this video because it's literally half an hour of a man with a beard using a color picker. So it's not as exciting as the other video, but, uh, but Pro Tools does have this really effective way of dealing with color, and that's to let users decide how they want to use it. Another uh, you know, really interesting property of color that you should be aware of when you're designing an interface, um, when you look at a computer screen that's about arm's length from your eyes, the area of the screen that you actually see clearly in sharp detail is about the size of a dime. Um, this is called your central or foveal vision. And the only reason we're able to understand the screen is that our eyes scan the screen and they build a larger picture, our brain builds a larger picture. Um, out of what we scan and see. But when we're actually focusing on something, what we see is a very small area. Um, and uh, one of the benefits of color is that our ability to perceive color actually extends farther um, out from our gaze direction than things like text or shape. Um, so that's, it's an effective tool that can guide us towards something relevant or warn us that something is wrong without even having to look directly at it. But our ability to see color actually fades as objects extend out into our periphery. So it takes a larger and larger block of color for us to recognize that color. So that's important to remember. But thankfully, there is something that our peripheral, uh, peripheral vision is very good at picking up, and that's motion. So you know, we can see motion farther than 90 degrees away from our gaze direction, um, which makes it an incredibly valuable, but also sometimes distracting uh, thing in interface design. So some of the ways you can use motion effectively in interfaces is to attract and guide attention, uh, to provide feedback for actions, you can help users understand the space they're navigating, and you can also give an application personality with motion. Um, oh, am I still on this? Sorry, I'm one slide behind where I thought I was. Um, so motion's great when you need to bring somebody's attention to something. Um, in, in the, the uh, app store on newer iPhones, it requires you to, use to, to double click the phone's side button in order to confirm a purchase. And in this case, there's, there's this animated hint that pulls your focus up to that button and demonstrates the new action for you. Um, really effective user interface choreography. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this interaction. You know, when you enter a pa the wrong password on Mac OS, the interface shakes its head at you. So uh, motion can be used like a sort of body language for interfaces that helps to communicate without words. Um, and motion can also give impor important feedback when you have to make users wait. And uh, Victor was talking about this a little bit earlier. Um, so some good tips for this. You know, first of all, always give immediate recognition that an action has been performed. So like that, that button bounces back up after it's been pressed. And then if you need to make the user wait more than a second or so, you can use motion to show that the system is working on something. Uh, an animation can't literally make the process go faster, but it can improve the perceived performance of an interface, which can make the experience feel a little more immediate to the user. And animations, that, by the way, that's my actual blood pressure right now. Um, no, not really. Um, probably about right, though. Um, and animations like this are suitable for an action that takes a few seconds. But if you're going to do something that takes minutes, you should definitely be showing some sort of progress indicator. And if you can, give an estimate of how long you think the process will take. Um, and, and definitely get creative. I mean, the question came up earlier, you know, what, uh, how can you make that waiting process better? Um, I've seen, you know, for example, in, in the audio industry, we have sometimes these, I'm sure you've used some of these, Eric, where you, you buy like a virtual instrument that downloads gigabytes of content on your hard drive and it takes forever. I've seen some, some um, you know, designers use that time to show you a little tutorial video on how to use the product. Um, so if you have to make users wait, you know, try to give them something else to do while they're waiting if you possibly can. Uh, motion can also help users orient themselves in sort of virtual space. So mobile devices have really small screens, but apps often have many possible views and menus. And you can use motion to smoothly move side to side between views that are at the same level of hierarchy. You can slide a view over other content to emphasize that it's being brought to the top of the hierarchy. 
And this can help the user build a better mental model of the application. And it can also give uh, you know, helpful feedback um, or uh, you know, give meaningful feedback for those invisible swipe gestures we were talking about, right? So you may not, not see a visual cue before you start swiping, but you, you see a visual cue as you're swiping that shows you what's happening. Um, and motion can also, uh, you know, provide a lot of personality to apps. Um, here's a more dramatic use of motion to show a transition between views. This is from the game Mini Metro, which if you feel like redesigning the London Tube map, you should definitely download this game. But the use of animation in this game, you know, there's, there are these great, cool rotations and long sweeping moves that bring you back to the main menu. Uh, and this game is really just, it's all flat shapes and primary colors, but motion really adds a lot of personality and depth to the overall experience of this app. And I think that's, that's really, uh, you know, one of the trends in modern UI design where, you know, it's not so cool anymore unless you're in the audio industry to use skeuomorphism to communicate that personality. But you, you, if you, even if you have a very flat interface, you can definitely use motion to do that. Um, some great guidelines from uh, uh, Chet Haas and Romain Guy at Google Android um, for using animation in interfaces. Uh, try to make animation smooth, or fast, smooth, natural, simple, and purposeful. And fast, that's, it's kind of an interesting point. A second is a really long time in interface animation. Uh, even half a second is a really long time. So definitely think about when you're using animation, you don't want to you don't want to uh, move slower than your users are thinking. So definitely test that use of motion in your interface and make sure that you're not you know that you're not being overindulgent. Because I think when you design uh, these cool you know interface animations, I think we're all really proud of ourselves when we you know design a really cool slick animation. But if it's really holding the user up, you want to refine that and speed it up. Um, so the last sort of topic I want to talk about is context. And this is another sort of really powerful tool we have in modern user interfaces. Um, and, you know, the, probably the most simple expression of context is the humble context menu, right? You see this in a lot of places where if you right click or double tap on an item, you'll get a list of, um, you know, actions that are relevant to just the thing in the interface that you're clicking on. Um, in, in, here in Spotify, you know, I get shortcuts to go quickly to the artist page or see the credits for a song or to share the song with a friend. And um, context can also help you focus the user's attention on relevant targets. So here's what happens when you drag a song uh, out of an album on Spotify. Like notice that Spotify grays out uh, the locations where you can't drop that song. Um, and, you know, such as other people's playlists that I'm, that I'm following. But Spotify is even smarter than that. It knows a lot about the context of the language you use to name things. So I created a new playlist and called it Shoegaze. And Spotify actually found some examples from that genre of music for me. Slow Dive, Chapter House, Ride, Lush. And I could definitely debate with you all day about whether the Cocteau Twins is Shoegaze. But I'll, I'll give them good points for that. It's a good choice. Um, still pretty impressive. And uh, Spotify has a, has a lot of context also about what you're already listening to. Um, and what other people like you are listening to. Here's a pretty good playlist that Spotify made for me um, after noticing that I've been listening to artists from Nordic countries. So it created this totally personalized playlist of artists from Norway, Sweden, Iceland, and Finland. And I've discovered some really good music this way that I probably wouldn't have otherwise. So making good recommendations based on context and data is a hugely important part of an application like this where there are 35 million possible songs. Um, Spotify is able to use machine learning to make sense of all that data its users generate, as well as the actual audio characteristics of songs to help group and categorize them. Um, and this kind of context-sensitive design based on machine learning is starting to find its way into music production, too. Uh, so you'll remember the equalizer we looked at um, in that video, or in the, in the Gestalt principles there, um, with its multicolored knobs. This is a more futuristic equalizer from my former employer, Isotope, called Neutron. And Neutron can automatically identify what kind of instrument is playing through it, and then it automatically sets itself up to be useful for that situation. And it can also, uh, you know, if you're using it within, um, within a song, it lets you compare different tracks to each other so you can make complementary equalization decisions. So there's this bar graph at the top that sort of shows um, collisions and frequency between two different instruments. I know it's pretty technical, but it's a really extremely useful uh, visual cue for audio engineers. Um, and you know what? Context is useful even for our London tube map um, with its 17 different color-coded lines. So the solution to this problem isn't to redesign the map with less colors. It's to redesign it based on context. Design a map that knows where the user is and where she's going, and now she only needs to enter her destination and then pay attention to two colors. So with that, we've made it to the figurative end of the line. Thanks for sticking with me. That was like about 
95 slides, so not bad for half an hour. Uh, I'm just going to wrap up with a couple quick, uh, you know, quick summary of the points that I hit on. First of all, try to use strong signifiers to make your possible actions clear, whether they're borrowed from the physical world or digital native signifiers. Use the Gestalt principles to create structure and hierarchy. Use color in moderation to communicate without words. Use motion carefully to guide attention. And pay attention to context to simplify what the user sees. Thanks.